All right. I think we ought to probably continue. So let's do that. And yeah, I hope you've had an opportunity to go through this check your understanding activity. If not, I'm just going to show it quickly because we do need to move on with the rest of the lesson material so that we don't run out of time. But essentially, if we took what we had above, I just copy all of this and paste it down here. We were asked to make a few changes. One is to have the temperature data go from the uh, 6 p.m. on the 1st of October instead of from noon. So we can make that change here quickly from making a 12 to an 18 for the start time. The end time was defined to be midnight on October 1st. I think it's actually maybe better for us to do zero zero on October 2nd. Uh, I think if you try to do it as 24 zero zero on October 1st, you may get an error message. Why don't we just try that first um, before doing anything else? Uh, we're asked to use a dotted black line to connect the points. So we'll take away the O because we don't want to show the symbols. We'll make the R into a K. And then I think if we do K dot, then we will have uh, a dotted black line shown that way. We had to change our title here to be evening temperatures on October 1st. I'm just going to copy that here and paste it in where our title was previously. And uh, if we run this, I think as it is, we still need to make our warmest temperature. So let's do warmest temperature in the evening. But we know that this uh, cold time should be changed to be warm time. And we'll change that to be warm time here. But we actually need to figure out what time that is. If I run that, yes, indeed, we do get an error message here because the hour must be between 0 and 23. So at least it's a useful error message that says, in order for this to work, we need to actually do 0, 0 on October 2nd for midnight of the time between October 1st and 2nd. If I run this, I have uh, maybe need to do this as it is a dotted line with the colon instead of a single dot because a single dot wants to show the points as dots. If I run that, now I get the dotted line. So that was a mistake on my part. And we can see our temperature range here. It looks like we probably don't need to go any warmer than 44, but maybe we do need to go colder for our cold temperatures. So let's say that 44 could be our warmest end. Let's set this to like 36 just to see what we're working with here. 36 takes us right down to the bottom of the plot. So let's go ahead and make that 35 degrees for our Y limit. And then we can see here that our coldest temperature looks like it's going to be between 7 and 8 p.m. There's two times when we get down to 36 degrees. Let's pick the first one. And uh, so it's between 7 and 8 p.m. Looks like probably about 720. So if we were to then make our warm time here to be 1920, we'd still have some work to do if we run this with that modification. Um, and our warmest temperature in the evening at 17. 20 does look about right here, except for we're up too high. So our temperature should be 36 instead of 42. Actually, warmest temperature in the evening. Sorry, I'm, I'm going for coldest temperature. So our warmest temperature actually should be, looks like maybe like 1040 p.m., uh, not what we had. So, and it looks like it's 43 degrees. Fix that one real quick. So 43 degrees. Uh, and it should be something like 10.40 p.m. So that's going to be 22.40 p.m. About right. Maybe it's 22.50. Uh, but yeah, we have a little bit of issue with the way the text is being positioned right now that probably we want to shift over to the left a little bit for where the text 
gets positioned. The point that you define here is going to be where it puts the left side of the text box. So let's put our left side of our text box somewhere over like 9 p.m. just to get this thing positioned right. So let's say 2100. That looks approximately right. And then if I just take my text and make it so that my arrow is on the other side, like this, and I run it once again, now we're getting there. So tinkering with the plotting obviously is something that uh, you can do ad nauseum, and that uh, does take time sometimes to get it right, but something like this doesn't look too bad. We've got the right range of temperatures and right range of dates, and we've indicated now the warmest temperature in the evening being just before 11 p.m. on the date we were looking at. So that was the idea, which is to play around a little bit, and hopefully you ended up somewhere close to something like that. Obviously, there's a few different things that you would need to change to get your plot to look this style. But yes, so we should continue. Let's show a couple examples of how to make some bar plots and how to save things. And uh, that should wrap up this first part of the lesson. So in order to do a bar plot in pandas, we don't really have to change much. We have our afternoon here that we could select to be our oct1 temps in the locations where the time is less than or equal to 3 p.m. So our afternoon will save between noon and 3 p.m. in this case. Then we can make a bar plot by just taking that range of temperatures we would have selected with the dot loc um, indexing to do oct1 afternoon dot plot kind equals bar. So we haven't included this kind parameter before. The default would be to be the kind as a line plot or scatter. Um, no, a line plot, I think, in this case. And then kind equals bar. We'll change that to a bar plot. There hasn't been much else that's changed here. And in fact, all you have to do is just run this cell to see an example of a bar plot in pandas where we've now specified here the coldest temperature in the text that's on the plot there. And you can see then bars for the different times at which the temperature observations were made and how temperatures have changed in this bar plot example. So that's just to show you that it's easy to do, easy to do a bar plot as well. Up to this point, everything we've been doing has been a plot that's shown up on the screen in our notebook, which is, uh, which is useful for the times we're working in the notebook. But of course, if you want to include a plot in like a presentation of some kind, you need a way to save that plot. All this stuff up here, basically, um, well, this piece creates the bar plot we just looked at. So there's nothing here that we haven't really seen before. But we're going to import matplotlib in order to be able to save the figure. That's because there is this PLT. So uh, that's the matplotlib's pyplot library. The sort of typical way to refer to it is you import matplotlib.pyplot as PLT. And then there's this plt.savefig function, which allows you to save a figure. So we can just do that here, plt.savefig. And then you put in a figure name in a character string like this, which we could just call bar-plot.png. So this will be a portable network graphics file format, PNG file. It's a nice, simple format for raster images. And if you run that with the plt.savefig, you'll see the figure gets displayed as it did before. But if we go over here to our file browser on the left side, what you should see if you refresh is that there's now this barplot.png file and if I double click on that, I can then see my bar plot image that was created before, now saved as a file that you could go and do whatever you like with. So that's handy. And so the plt.savefig option is a nice thing to, to have. Let's copy that one because we'll modify this in just a second. Oops. So copy. If I go down here below, uh, here's another example just to show you another way of saving a different file format. So I'm going to paste in here where I had my plt.savefig from before. Let's now call our figure instead of uh, bar-plot. Let's call it bar-plot high-res. 
So we're going to save a high resolution bar plot in a PDF format. And here we can set the DPI, the dots per inch to be 600, which will give us a high resolution uh, for the figure that is going to be saved here. I run this again, I see the figure displayed in the notebook, but also if I look over here on the left and I refresh, I now have this bar plot high res PDF file that I can double click on. And now it may not look like anything special here, but of course, if I click and uh, I guess that's search, I thought I could zoom in. Yeah. Okay. So I can zoom in just by clicking the plus. I can click and zoom in, and you can see that it's a nice high resolution that's been used for the file in this case. Ah, stupid thing popping up. Um, so yeah, if we automatic zoom, it'll take us back to the to the view there. But if you want to save high resolution figures in PDF format, it's easy to do. All you have to do basically is just change the file extension and matplotlib will recognize that it's a PDF file and save it in that format. And uh, it's noted, I think here, that there's a number of useful formats you can use for PNG, PDF, EPS, and so on to export your files in a number of different file formats. All right, so lastly, I just show very quickly this demonstration of the interactive plotting with pandas bokeh. We don't really have time to go into using this in detail, but essentially it's a backend that can be used for plotting bokeh plots in a uh, notebook. And we have to import the library to be able to use it. And then there's a couple commands here that set things up for the plotting to use pandas bokeh by default. So if you just run this cell, You'll hopefully see this little symbol that says bokeh.js or bokeh.js successfully loaded. And if we scroll down here, we now have a plot where we're going to take September 29th to October 1st using our, again, a selection out of our data frame here to take all dates that are greater than the beginning of the day on the 29th of September. So that should give us 29th, 30th, and 1st of October. So it should be three days of data there and then we have our start time and end time defined as we would have them normally and if i just run this cell there's not too much different than before we have ax here we have the data frame for the selection we've just made dot plot we said title x x label y label fig size looks a little different here because the figure size now is given in pixels instead of inches that's just a difference with bokeh uh, but otherwise, everything looks pretty much the same as it did before. But if you run this, what you'll see now is a little bit different looking style for the plot. And I'm going to go ahead and hide this file browser so I can see the whole plot, where now we have our interactive plot format here. I can go and, for instance, click on max or click on min in the axis uh, legend, rather, the line legend. And now when I go along here, moving my mouse cursor, I can see the temperatures and how they vary at different times in the plot here. I could click and zoom into a specific range of temperatures and see that data. I could click the uh, refresh button to take me back to the default view. And essentially now I've very easily created my interactive plot just like this. So, there's a couple of minor things that are noted here that have to be changed in order to use, to use pandas bokeh, but otherwise, with very little change from what we've been doing otherwise to plot in pandas, I can just click shift enter on one of these cells. Here I've added in the plot data points equals true parameter to get our points to be displayed. And now you can see, for instance, the maximum temperature points showing up. Uh, again, if you click on items in the legend, they will disappear. And so you can see the data now in this way, or you could turn that on and see only the min and max temperatures for each one of those days. So that's the interactive plotting with pandas bokeh. You can play around with that if you would like, but that's unfortunately about all the time we have for demonstrating that in today's lesson. So we need to jump back over here to now our advanced plotting lesson 
This should also be something that doesn't take us a huge amount of time to go through, but you'll find it very useful for the final exercise and for the lesson, uh, lesson seven exercise here. Basically, what we've done is shown some examples of how to make different styles of plots for individual plots in, uh, in pandas using the pandas plotting and sometimes with some matplotlib modifications. And now what we're going to do is show how to make an example of some seasonal temperature observations for winter, spring, summer, and autumn for a range of years here from 2012. Uh, I guess this is through, maybe it's just two years, 2012 to 2013, seasonal temperature observations from the Helsinki Vanta airport. So uh, this is actually one year because we're starting in beginning of December 2012 and going through the end of November of 2013. So we have one year of data that we're going to show here in four different panels. And so now we're going to learn how to make plots where we have multiple panels. The data we're dealing with is the same data we had before, so nothing that needs to happen there. We'll start by running the cell at the top, which will import pandas and import matplotlib, so we can use those things read in our data file the same way that we did previously. So this is exactly what we did in the last lesson. No worries about that. Again, it takes a moment to read it in. So that's uh, to be expected. As you'll see, we have a decent amount of data that we're working with here. And in fact, that's what we'll do here while we wait for this to load, is we can first print out how much data we have. We'll do this with an F string. So number of rows of data that we have, I'm getting all the wrong keys. In this case, we can take len of data to tell us the number of rows. So we'll just put that in some curly braces there. And once your data file has loaded, you'll see like a number two, for example, here, if you run the cell with the number of rows, you can see that we have 930,000 plus temperature observations. So it's a pretty good data so file size, almost a million observations. And if we do something like data.head, we can take a look at the first, first few rows. Here's our date time index, as we saw before. This is actually the same data we dealt with earlier, so no surprises here. But we do see that this is temp, and maybe if you happen to be paying attention a moment ago, you would have noticed we had temperatures in Celsius here, we have temperatures in Fahrenheit in our data file. So we could do this rename operation that we did last week. Just shift enter to run this cell. We'll just make this dictionary to convert temp to be temp F and then do data.rename to change the column names. And now if we do data.head as we did previously, you'll see now we have temp F instead of temp. So very uh, quick reminder of how to do the data rename nothing special to type in there, but just so that you're aware. So we have a few things we need to deal with here. We've got a lot of missing data um, in different columns. And, you know, we probably want to take some of those values out just so that we don't have them in the data file for the plotting. So if we were to do something like figure out how much missing data we have, we can do print. We'll do another F string in this case. Uh, number of no data values per column. And then I'm gonna do this backslash N to make a new line. And then we'll put in our value that we want to show after that, which is data dot is N A dot sum. So this will list all the values that would be uh, not uh, or that would be no data and then sum them up. So we'll see for each column, how many missing values we have in the example from the, the course page, there's 1644, but in our example of the data file we're dealing with, there's more 3,579 missing values. And, uh, so that's in the temp F column. In the others, in max and min, you can see there's 900,000 missing values. So we're missing a lot of data in those columns. But we're still missing some data in our actual regular observation column as well. 
So let's drop that. Let's remove those values using the drop NA method. So we can do that with data.drop NA. We saw how to do this previously. The subset we want to use in this case is going to be here our temp F column. And we're going to do this in place, which means that in our data, data frame, we'll drop the values and then save that modified data frame as the current name that we're already using. So that will drop all the NA values or all the rows containing uh, missing data that are in the temp F column, such that now if we print out our uh, let's do another F string number of rows after removing missing data. Uh, we could then say, again, len of data like we did before. So this will print out the number of rows now with our dropped values. And now you see there's 928,188. If you scroll back up to when we first looked at the length of data, we had 931,000. So yes, we've dropped around three or 4,000 values out, which makes sense because we had 3,500 values that were missing and everything looks okay now. Uh, we can skip this check your understanding thing here. Um, if we were to do something like drop out the number of values that we have uh, for all the columns that contain missing data, we would end up with a different situation. So for instance, if we looked at the length of what we have after we do data.drop drop an A with no subset. So that means it'll drop any row that has missing data. Uh, you see here that we have only 20,000 rows left after doing that. So if we were to drop all the rows with missing data, we only have 20,000 rows left out of the 930,000 we started with. Obviously we've done something and dropped way too much data there. Um, and then, you know, if we were to look at the length of data. If we didn't do that, you can see here that we had many more values. So we would have dropped the vast majority of our data set if we made the mistake of not including the subset. So it's important to pay attention here that when you're dropping values that you, you list a subset so that you don't end up dropping all or the vast majority of your data. Okay, let's convert our temperatures to Celsius. We've done this a few times before, so I'm just gonna kind of do it somewhat quickly. So here we have our data. Let's make a new column called temp underscore C. And we'll say it's going to be equal to data. Actually, let's put some parentheses here. Data for the column temp underscore F minus 32 and then divided by 1.8. So this is our conversion factor, again, to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius. Run that, and then do data.head, and we should see the new column here containing our temperature values in Celsius. And we can see these are all temperatures that are just above freezing in Fahrenheit and just above freezing in Celsius. So it looks like our conversion worked correctly. Okay, hey, we've done this stuff before, so I'm just kind of going through it somewhat quickly to uh, to allow us to get to making the subplots and th seeing things uh, as you would like here. So we have in our subplots example here the idea that we should extract different seasonal temperatures. So we want to have winter that goes from December 2012 to February 2013 spring, which is March through May of 2013, summer, which is June through August of 2013, and then autumn, which is September, that's uh, September. 
September, yes, uh, 2013 to November 2013. So the examples for spring, summer, and autumn are listed below. We can put in our example for winter here, and we'll use data.loc to select some values. The values we want to select in this case, we're going to do with two conditions. So one is the starting date, and the other is the ending date. And we've seen how to do this uh, in some of the previous lessons, like in last week's lesson. Here we can do it where our data.index values have to be greater than or equal to the first day of December 2012. And we'll put that in as a character string here. So the year 2012, uh, 12, the month of December, first day of December, and then the beginning of that day at midnight. So zero, 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 zero for the hour of that day. So the date has to be greater greater than or equal to the uh, first of December, and it has to be less than the first of March. So we want it to be less than the first of March, which means we'll get all of February in there. But we're saying less than and, and specifically not less than or equal to, but just less than to exclude that first day of March. So again, we have a second condition in this case where our data.index is now less than, and again, we need to give here 2013, March 1st, so 0301, and then 0000. So the beginning of the day on the first day of March, but we don't want to include that, so that should do it this way. And then finally, we can say winter underscore temps. Just for convenience, we'll make a separate uh, pandas series here, which would contain winter and only the values in the temp underscore C column. So this allows us to select our range of dates from a starting date and then up to an ending date. So this will take from our data frame only the values for this one range of dates here from the 1st of December 2012 to the last day of February of 2013. And that will be our winter temperatures. And then we store that just as for convenience as a separate pandas series called winter underscore temps. It makes it a bit easier when we're plotting just to have that single value to plot. If you run that, it should very quickly run and make those cells. We've done exactly the same thing for spring, summer, and autumn. You can have a look if you would like. Now, what we want to do is create some plots. So we had before just done AX equals something, but since we have four plots, we could say AX1 equals, and then we'll do winter underscore temps dot plot. So we've selected our winter temperature data. Now we do winter temps dot plot to make the plot. And we assign that to a var variable here called AX1, just because this is our one of our plot axes. Then we do the same thing for AX2, 3, and 4 for the spring, summer, and autumn. We run this. You'll see that we get some temperatures here plotted. Looks like we're starting on uh december 1st 2012 that looks good ending here at the first of march 2013 i think if we looked at the plot we'd see it actually doesn't go up to and include that but ends right there and uh, of course we can see now what look like winter ish temperatures here generally being below freezing if we run the same thing for the spring we now see here's our springtime temperatures showing things warming up over the months from March and up to the beginning of June. The summer, we can see our relatively warm temperatures. And then, of course, in the autumn, we should expect to see the cooling down toward the next winter. And sure enough, that's the general trend that we see. So we have different seasons. And one thing you can see in our plots is that the range of temperatures here goes from a little above 5 degrees to minus 30. In the spring, we go from a little below minus 20 to a little above plus 20. We've got temperatures of up to 30 and as low as about 5 degrees in the summer. And then 
in the fall from about a little over 20 degrees down to about minus 10 in the axis range. If we want to plot all these panels together, it's helpful for us to actually have consistent range of temperatures on all four seasons so we can see which one is easily visually warmer than another season because by default, the plot will just try to fill the, the, the area that's available. So we can de determine these um, season temperature ranges using a little trick that we can do here where we can calculate, for instance, min underscore temp. What we'll do, uh, do you have it with quotation marks like winter temps? Uh, I just got an error message for winter temp C. Uh, yeah, the temp C thing here, this has to be in quotation marks when you list the name of a column. Yeah. I think it is possible to do winter dot temp underscore C, but uh, the thing that we try to stick to is, is having winter temp C in quotation marks. Got an error message, even though you have it in quotation marks. What's the error message? If you can paste it into the chat, we can see in case anyone else has this same error. I guess you have to make sure that you have run this line first to create the, the winter temperature slice or the range of temperatures, range of dates for the winter. And again, it's winter equals data.loc. And then you have these in parentheses like that and should at that point. Everything is the same. Uh, can you paste the error message possibly into the chat? If you can do that, then I can have a have a look. Otherwise, uh, I'm not sure what to suggest. I think this should be working unless there's a missing quotation mark or something like that. And the error just says temp C. Mm. Hmm. I'm not sure what to suggest about that. Uh, I don't think Hovart is here. So um, I don't know. I guess it would be helpful to have the full message that gets dumped to the screen when you run the cell if it's producing an error message, just so you can see the whole thing. But uh, if you're having problems, maybe it's easiest just to follow along for the moment because I think um, you can see on the course page how to, to do this part of the lesson if you're not able to do it at the moment. Uh, yeah, if you want to put a photo in Slack or something like that, that might be easiest because it's not going to go into the Zoom chat very well. But if you put it to Slack, I can have a look at the the error message in uh, in Slack. I do have that open here. Okay, so we've created these different seasons and the goal here now is to, to set consistent ranges of temperatures so that when we put them on the plots, we can see which season is warmer, which season's colder, et cetera, et cetera. The min temp that we'll come up with here is going to be using a little trick where we can use this built-in function called min, which will find the minimum of a list of values. And we can just take our different temperatures we have. So we have like winter temps dot min, which will give us the minimum temperature that we have for that winter temperature range. And we can take the same thing for the spring underscore temps dot min. You can copy the line down here if you want to just edit it, if you don't want to type this all in. Same thing for summer, underscore temps, dot min, and autumn, underscore temps, dot min. So this is going to find the minimum temperature for each of these seasons, winter, spring, summer, autumn. And then what it's going to do is to uh, 
find the minimum of those four seasonal minimum temperatures. So each one of these will give a seasonal minimum temperature, and then the min command will find the minimum of all of them. So that will find the lowest temperature overall. And then just to add a little bit of extra padding so that we're not having the plot line hit right to the bottom of the, the plot window, we can say our min temp equals min underscore temp minus five degrees. So this will give us a little bit of extra space at the bottom of the plot. So if I just run this, You'll see here now the min is minus 35, the max is plus 35. And I'm just gonna take a quick look at the error message here. Uh, okay. Mm -mm. Key error, temp C. Okay, so it looks like what it's complaining about uh, for the error message here is it's not finding a column called temp C. Uh, so earlier up here, when we had done the conversion of our temperatures from Fahrenheit to Celsius on this line, in the data data frame, we had created a new column called temp C that was our temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32 and then divided by 1.8. If you didn't run this line, then there would be no column called temp C in the data data frame yet. And, uh, and then when you did data.head here, you wouldn't see this column. It looks like what it's complaining about when it's trying to actually create the, uh, the winter temps here is that it doesn't find a column called temp C when trying to, to do that. So maybe go back and just ch double check that you actually did the conversion of temperature to from Fahrenheit to Celsius. That's what it looks like. Uh, uh, so yeah, I think it's this, uh, Okay, yeah, so the temp underscore C in the, again, in the, just looking at the, the Slack uh, figure here, it is case sensitive. So if you've done temp underscore C with lowercase letters, then this should also be lowercase when you refer to the column. Otherwise uh, it will see temp C with capital T and lowercase E M P as different from those being the same with all capital letters. Okay, so that should hopefully resolve that issue. So what we did here is just find our data bounds. We've got our minimum and maximum temperatures, and now you can see that the min temp that we found overall must have been minus 30. And then we subtracted five again, and you'll see why in a moment, just to add some padding around the values in the plot. Now let's go ahead and make our first set of subplots. We're gonna do this a little bit differently than what we did before, but we're gonna uh, create here first our set of subplots using a matplotlib subplots function. So now we're gonna have fig comma ax s equals plt dot subplots. So when we use this function, it returns two values. It returns something that are the plot axes, and it also returns something for the figure. Because we have a figure window and then there's plots within there, they're, they're returned separately. We're gonna say n rows equals two, n calls, number of columns, equals two. And we can also include the figure size here. Uh, because remember with the four plots now, we're not gonna specify a figure size for each plot. We create the figure in matplotlib's kind of terminology, the figure is the, you know, could contain multiple plots. So we first create the figure and then we put plots inside the figure or axes inside the figure, but we'll do this fig size 12 comma eight, like we did before. And then if we just, after that type AXS down below, that'll print out what the axes uh, or the AXS variable has in it. So when you run this, 
you should hopefully see you get these four plot panels. There's nothing in them because we haven't told them yet what to plot. We've just created the place to put the data. And when you type AXS, it shows you that we have here uh, an array. We haven't really dealt with array objects too much, but what you can look inside there is here we have a Python list with two items in it that are both axes subplots. And then there's a second row where we have two more axes subplots. So these would allow us to refer to the first, second, third, and fourth of the plots that we have here in our example. To make it a little bit easier for us to refer to them individually, instead of having to use like an index value. So like here, this would be index zero, zero, index zero, one, index one comma zero, and index one comma one. Gets kind of clumsy to type that in. So we can rename them just by running this cell here. So this will take the plot that's at position zero, zero. So that should be top left and uh, refer to it now as AX11 and then AX0S01, which would be top right. We'll now refer to as AX12, 21 and 22. So this is our kind of way of referring to these individual plot panels that we can just do by running that cell like it is there. Now we're gonna put some data into these different places. So we've created this object, this uh, figure and these different four plot panels, but we haven't told them what data to, to plot. And we can do that now here. So what we're going to do in order to do that is add our plot commands. So we had our winter underscore temps that we created. We'll do inter winter underscore temps dot plot. And we'll add in a new parameter here called AX, which tells it which set of axes to use. And we'll say AX11, which should be our top left plot. And then we can say our color C, which we'll say C, e <coughs> sorry, C equals, uh, let's go with blue. Then we can add our line width, which we can abbreviate as LW. And we've set a value here for the line width. And then we have our Y limb, because this is our range of temperatures that we want to be consistent on all the plots. So our Y limb is going to be get every other vowel except I. Y limb equals min underscore temp max underscore temp. So that'll create our plot of the winter temperatures. And it's going to go to axis AX11, which is going to be the top left. It'll be blue with a line width that's set to 1.5. And then the range of temperatures will be from min temp to max temp. And then when we type fig down here, it should display our figure. Okay, so now we have our seasonal temperatures. We can see things that have the same range of temperature for each season. So you can see, for instance, here that the temperatures in the winter are generally colder than those in the spring and the summer, and then how things cool down in the fall. So that looks pretty good overall. There's some issues we still have. Uh, for instance, our labels for our dates are sort of interfering with, uh, with the plots that are coming up on top of them. And we can do a little bit better by basically making a small set of changes. So we'll do the same thing we just did before, create our subplots uh, and renew this process. So we did exactly this before to create our figure and our axes. So let's just do that again. And now we'll modify our plot a little bit here. And I think actually you probably don't need to do any modifications here. This is just to demonstrate a few things. So now we've added in the grid equals true parameter. So that'll add some grid lines to the plot, which makes it a little bit easier to see how the temperatures are varying. We've added a subtitle. So this is like a title for all of the figures or for the like, it's sort of like a title for the figure, not for the individual plots, but this will be for our whole figure as 2012, 2013 seasonal temperature observations, Helsinki Vanta Airport. 
I've also now rotated the X axis labels. This is not uh, sort of, this is a little bit more advanced topic, but just rotating them slightly so that they're not being uh, overlapping with the plots. And then added some axis labels here. This is done to individual plots, as you'll see in just a moment. And then we've added some text on there to show the different seasons and visually make that more clear. So if we run this cell, don't have to make any modifications. You can now see our grid lines have appeared. We've got text to label the different seasons. And we have rotated the axis labels slightly so that they don't get overprinted by the plots for these four different plot panels. You can also see that there's a temperature axis label on the left side of the left plots, but not on the ones on the right. And that the date is labeled on the bottom two plots, but not on the ones above, just because we don't need to do that when all four plots are showing the same kind of data. Um, I think we can skip this check your understanding thing here. I did want to show you one very quick thing about some style sheets you can use with pandas and matplotlib, and then we ought to get on to talking about the exercise and things like that for this week. But there's these sort of style sheets get, that can be used with pandas and matplotlib to change many different characteristics of the plots. So um, we'll use one here called dark background. You can just run this cell to change the style that's being used to the dark background style. Take the same thing that we plotted before. So I just copied this from above and run the cell. So this is all of the steps to create the figure we had before. And what you can get in this example now is a black background plot with the same data that we had previously. And you can see the text has been converted to white. The grid lines have been made white. The background has been made black. And this is just one of the style options that you can see. If you go to the link here, I just threw this in there uh, yesterday just as a thing to kind of show that there are these possibilities. You go to the link here for the style sheets reference, you can see the default plot style and the colors that are going to be used by default in that plot lib. But then if you scroll down, you can see here's our dark background example. And there are some other options that I like to use. Uh, I mentioned Seaborn earlier. The Seaborn plotting style is visually kind of nice looking. So I often end up using one of these Seaborn plotting options for making figures myself. And it's just as easy to go and, for instance, take Seaborn dash dark grid as the plot style. So let's go up here and just do this. So we could say Seaborn dash dark grid as the plot style. Run this cell once again, and you get a different plot style than what we saw before. Now this is the Seaborn style, which I think, uh, I guess we didn't, uh, hide these access labels there that probably should have been hidden. Uh, the, the formatting is slightly different now so that that text was previously hidden behind this plot and now it's visible, but whatever, you get the point that you can easily change the style of the plots and certain styles might fit your visual preferences better than others. So that was our lesson on plotting. I think the second part was gone through a little bit quickly, but you'll get an opportunity to practice with this stuff in the exercise this week. And for the final exercise for the course, uh, you'll also have opportunity to explore that further. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so if not, let's go here now. You'll see we have exercise seven and a final exercise still to discuss. And uh, I have exercise seven pulled up here. Exercise seven is a little bit lighter than exercise six. I hope you'll find that to be the case. And essentially you have to do two problems here in exercise seven because we have the final exercise and that takes a little bit more time. Uh, and that's worth a little bit more of your grade. So. Uh, obviously, we want to give you some time to be able to work on that. A couple things to note right away. One is that exercise seven is due by 5 p.m. on Friday next week. So instead of 
Because we don't have class next week on Wednesday, we'll give you till Friday, the 29th of October to complete exercise number seven. And uh, hopefully, again, that that helps a little bit to have a bit of extra time. Next week is a uh, sort of study break. So um, hopefully you can both take a little bit of a break and then still have time to complete this part of this exercise. We have our two problems. I'll just open them up here and here. Problem number one is just to get some practice with making plots and to create this kind of candy plot of these colorful little dots in here. And uh, you'll save this as a PNG file and then put it in your GitHub repository to complete this problem. Essentially, we're just gonna take random points, random colors and make a plot that will look more or less like this. It won't look exactly like this because the random numbers you get will be different. But the random points, I think this is a thousand random points that are plotted with random colors. And you'll see something that looks like this. Uh, the basic idea is to create a data frame with a thousand X and Y and color points in it, then make a scatter plot using the instructions that are provided, add a title and some axis labels, and, uh, and then save a copy of the plot to your GitHub repository. I will note that most likely you're going to want to go here to the exercise seven page for the course page and take a look at this hint about generating random numbers. You will almost certainly need this to create your random points that you're going to color. So please remember to go take a look at the hints when you start working on problem one for the exercise this week. But otherwise, I think it's fairly straightforward what to do. Uh, you'll be using a scatter plot, which we haven't done yet in, in pandas, but it's really quite simple just to set the kind equals scatter parameter, and that will be that. For problem number two, we're going to practice again plotting some temperature data. Here we have temperatures for the Helsinki Vanta airport from 1988 to 2019, I believe, the last 30 years. And we have a data file that contains these temperature data in a format that looks like it's described here. It contains actually a lot of the things that you need. You don't have to do much manipulation. So we have year, month, and day for the date. We have temperature F, temperature C. We have ref reference temperature. Uh, and then we have diff C, which is the difference between the monthly mean and the long-term average temperatures. What you need to do is load the data file and use the dates as an index, select the data for a 30 year period as described, and then make a line plot with the specified format, add a title and axes, and then save the plot to a PNG file. So it's basically um, not a lot of pandas heavy duty data analysis stuff more just like loading in a data file and practicing creating a plot of the data and following the list of instructions here if you want there's then an optional task where you can create an interactive version of the same plot using pandas bokeh but that's purely an optional exercise so you should pr produce a plot that looks like this basically That's exercise seven. And the other thing that's hanging here is the final exercise for the course. And this, there's again, a few differences to some of the previous exercises. Exercise seven, you're welcome to continue to work with your partner as you have previously. Uh, it is optional. So if you're not wanting to work with your partner, uh, whoops, this should be 2021. Um, that's fine too, but for the final exercise, this is meant to be done individually. So this means that everyone should do this um, in their own repository. You can of course talk with your partner and talk with other students in the class, but you should be turning in your own work that's done um, and, and sort of written by your own hand in your own repository. So we're gonna check everyone who's in the course for their repository for grading this final exercise. Another notable difference is that the exercise is worth about four normal exercises worth of points. So it's worth 40 points. Um, this is largely just because it, it provides us some way to actually assess 
uh, how well you've done with learning the different things in the course, but don't worry about this too much. I mean, it's uh, there's a certain number of these points that you'll get, I think, without too much difficulty. So the other important thing to note at the moment is that this exercise is due by five o'clock on November 19th. So you have about three weeks, uh, actually more than that time uh, to complete this this exercise. So from today, you've got almost a month uh, to complete the exercise, which we hope provides you enough time to be able to, to do that. We don't want to keep you busy for that entire time, but we do realize there are other courses you're taking and exams and things like that. So you can't be exclusively doing things for this course. What we're doing in the exercise is taking uh, temperature data from the last 100 years from Sodankula in northern Finland. And we're going to do an analysis of that data to look at seasonal temperature anomalies. Your goal is somewhat similar to what you've done in exercise six. Uh, to go from the years 1909 to 2019 and produce now a plot showing the temperature anomalies for the different seasons, winter, spring, summer, and autumn. And you'll end up with something in the end that shows how the temperatures have been changing from 1909 to 2019. You're given a data file to do this. The data file looks like this. Uh, should look somewhat familiar as this is a data file format that's similar to what was used in exercise six, I believe. But we have here uh, an example of the first five lines where you can see there's some headings, but then there's also these dashed lines that should be ignored when you read the data file in. Otherwise, you have a date, average, max, and min temperature. One thing that you'll notice that's a little bit different here, and you might notice this right away, is that there's a lot of missing values for the T average column. In this exercise, one of the things you'll have to do that's a little bit different is to try to fill in an estimate of the T average value in places where those values are missing. What that means is that if you find in a given row, like we see here for 1908, uh, first day of January, that the missing value for, or the temperature value that's reported here is missing, then what we want to do is fill in an estimate, which we can estimate as the average temperature by taking the max temperature and the min temperature and finding the average of those two. It's just, it's a rough estimate. It's not necessarily a great, uh, you know, it's not guaranteed to be very accurate, but it at least gives us some estimate of what the temperature would be on that day, because we know it's between the max and the min and possibly the average would be somewhere right in the middle of those two. So you can average the max and min to give you an estimate of T average. But you should only fill that in if the temperature average is actually missing. If there's a value that's been reported here, then you don't want to overwrite it with your estimate. You want to continue to use the, the reported value. So that's something you have to deal with. Otherwise, um, what we've done is give you an empty notebook. So there's instructions here for what you're supposed to do, but you're free to choose how you want to do this. So you've got to do things like read in the data file and convert the missing data values to NA values. So you can see, for instance, here, missing data is reported as minus 9999. Those should be converted to NAN or NA values in pandas when you read the data in. Then you have the missing values in the T average column that you need to fill in with your estimates of the average daily temperature as noted here in the data section. So that's this little note here. And uh, you can drop any remaining values that are still missing. So if you have, for instance, no max or min temperature for the day and a missing T average, then you could just drop the values that are still missing at that point. You can then make a function to convert temperatures in Fahrenheit to Celsius. We've done that a few times, so hopefully that's not too, too bad. And then point four, which probably will be where you spend a bit of your time, is to calculate the seasonal average temperatures for each season. So winter 1909, spring 1909, summer 1909, et cetera, uh, with the following months that would be part of each season. So we have daily observations, and what we want to do is get a seasonal average temperature for each season of each year. 
You can then calculate the average temperatures for a reference period, like what you've done in problem, uh, problem three from exercise six, from 1951 to 1980. So there'll be four values in total in this case. You'll have the average winter temperature for that range of, of years, the average spring, average summer, and average autumn temperature for 1951 to 1980. And then you'll do like what you did in exercise six to create seasonal temperature anomalies for each year. Same basic idea. Instead of months, we now have seasons, but essentially the same work process would occur from exercise six in what you do here. And then finally, the last step, once you have your seasonal temperature anomalies will be to make the plot like what you see above. Since we give you a totally empty notebook for this exercise the idea is that we also want you to use markdown cells to kind of explain what you're doing so you can kind of um, get some practice with writing markdown to fill in what you've actually done in your analysis in order to produce the plots that you end up with in the end and of course you should also have some code comments inside the code cells with this there is a grading reference here so if you go to the course page, you'll find a table that tells you kind of how you will be assessed for each of the parts of the exercise. So there is 40 points in total, and there are eight items here where you can get anywhere from a five to a zero for each one of those items. So for reading in the data file, for example, if you read in the data file using pandas, you skip the header row and you convert the minus 999 values to NA, then you would get the five points for that section. For processing the input data, if you do the sort of es estimation of the missing temperature average values and fill those in properly and then drop the remaining missing temperatures, then you would get the five points for processing the input and so on and so forth. For the plot, there's two different things here. So one is whether you plotted the correct data and the other is whether the plot formatting is, is correct. And then lastly, there's something about markdown and something about the code comments and style. So it's laid out fairly well for you here, what you need to do in order to get the points for the different sections. And I hope that you'll find that useful as a reference. But if you go here to the final exercise and you look at the notebook, what you'll see is that it is empty. And that's the challenge I think in this case is that we're giving you the freedom in a sense to take what you have learned in the previous exercises and put it together here in a notebook of your own where you explain what you're doing and uh, ultimately end up with hopefully a plot that looks something like this here with data instead of these text labels on the plot. Are there any questions about this final exercise? So will we still be able to ask you questions regarding the final task? Yeah, I think that's fine. You're welcome to still ask uh, questions to, um, I mean, it's not treated as like an exam per se. We may be a little bit, uh, we don't necessarily want to give away explicitly answers to the questions, but we'll try to help you still. So if you have problems, if you have questions, please do still feel free to ask myself, Hovard, uh, Alexi or Brian, if you have, you know, things that you're concerned about, we're still here to help on Slack. Uh, there won't be a dedicated separate exercise session for this, but we're also, you know, used to doing kind of meetings online. And if there's a need to sort of go on Zoom briefly and just chat there, we can also arrange that. We do want to support you and help you do this, but, um, it's kind of uh, probably not fun for you, but it's fun for us as teachers in a sense to see how you approach this problem. We've now given you some examples of how to do things. And now it's like uh, we've been teaching you how to ride the bike and now we're taking the training, wheel, training wheels off and uh, hoping that you're able to sort of keep yourself upright and, uh, and, and not crash. And I think everyone can do it, um, but you know, this is something where it may feel a little bit more intimidating at first, but if you look at what you're doing, 
and you look back at what you've done in the earlier exercises, I hope that you'll see that this is in many ways similar to what you've had to do for the previous exercises. And it's pieces of what you've seen in the lessons, pieces of what you've already done in the exercises. And I think uh, you're all capable of, of doing this. Um, and if you need help, of course, please let us know. Are there any other questions about the final exercise, exercise seven, anything else about the course at this point? Um, I should mention, I was going to run the auto grader on exercise five yesterday. I ran out of time to do that. So I'll try to do that today. So you should see at least the preliminary grades for exercise uh, five today. For exercise number six, I will post in Slack that we can extend the due date for exercise six to be uh, until maybe the end of the day on Friday this week. So if you're still working on that one, you'll you'll have a few uh, a bit of extra time to finish that up. Please, if you have questions, do try to come to the exercise help sessions. Uh, I think those, you know, the questions that that you have hopefully could be addressed relatively quickly and you won't end up stuck for like working two, three days on the exercise. Um, because oftentimes I think it's something where like, if you talk to one of the teachers in the course for five minutes, we can get you uh, sorted out and headed in the right direction quite quickly. So uh, if there's not anything else, I can stay on for just a moment on Zoom, but uh, I would, like to say on behalf of Hovard and the course assistants, thanks for taking part of the course and uh, taking part in the course and joining us here to learn some Python. Uh, it's a bit, I don't think disappointment is the right word, but it's a bit um, difficult in a sense to send you off here at this point when people are struggling with one of the exercises and maybe feeling a bit like they're not capable of, of doing the things in the course. Uh, we do try to introduce this to beginners, but of course we also want to challenge you. And I still firmly believe that, uh, that everyone who's here in the course, if you've been following along things and doing the exercises, I think you're all capable of doing it. And, uh, and I would encourage you just to try and, and reach out and get some assistance if you need it so that we can help you and maybe get you sort of back in the right place thinking that, uh, that you really can do this because I think the kind of coding we're doing, if we showed you this on day one, I'm sure all of you or the vast majority would have said, there's no way I can do that. But we've built our way up slowly. Uh, we took a bigger step with week six, but um, but yeah, I feel like uh, it's the sort of thing I enjoy the most about the course, uh, other than being in a classroom when we can do, do that, is seeing things pop up where students have done something in Python in later courses or hearing from a colleague that somebody used Python to do some cool plots in their master's thesis or whatever. That's the most rewarding part of the course for me. And I really hope that uh, all of you take the uh, opportunity here to continue to work and to practice with your Python skills. And, and you'll see that there's so many things you can do with a little bit of Python code. And, um, and yeah, I look forward to hopefully seeing some some things later down the line from, from some of you where you use a bit of Python and, uh, and take what you've learned here and apply it. So otherwise, thanks. I'm glad you were all able to join the course. I would really love to have done it in a classroom in person, but uh, this is the next best thing. And uh, we have to make do with, with the situation as it is. So I think maybe that's it for now. And for those who need some assistance, please remember to sign up for a time in the exercise sessions. We'll see you there and we'll be here on Slack and, and available if you have questions otherwise. So thanks and uh, best of luck with the, the last exercise.